I'm joined by Democratic Congressman Ro Khanna from California's 17th. Congressman, welcome to the show. Great to be back on. Perfect pronunciation. So many people mispronounce my name. I'm impressed. Nailed it. Let's talk about the House Oversight Committee that you sit on. From your perspective, and you've been there uh, now for some time, uh, how dysfunctional is it under the MAGA Republican control with uh, uh, James Comer leading it? Well, it's been a total failure. I mean, they they have witnesses that they call up for President Biden's uh, quote unquote impeachment, who then testify that there's not enough evidence to bring any hearing against Biden. So their own witnesses basically end up contradicting them. And uh, we've got a brilliant uh, ranking member in Jamie Raskin. And all you have to do is watch his clip on, on almost any hearing he schools uh, whoever the Republican is who's trying to uh, offer any uh, insight into constitutional law. You know, so there's the clear incompetence or gross incompetence. You know, they, they've also been relying, the MAGA Republicans have been relying on foreign agents, people who are, you know, agents of Russia, agents of the CCP as their witnesses to try to overthrow a sitting president. And then when they're called out on it, their response basically is like, yeah, what, 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 whatevs. We never said they were that important, even though there's all the tape of them saying, this is our key whistleblower, or, that's our key whistleblower. I mean, this is a whole new level of laundering foreign agents as their witnesses in, in critical committees. What do you make of that? I mean, I don't think they realize how absurd this Sounds they had a witness, uh, Parnas, uh, who basically under oath said that William Barr uh, was involved, as was the Trump administration, in getting him to go to foreign countries like Russia to uh, try to dig up dirt uh, on uh, President Joe Biden. Uh, that And he's admitting this in front of everyone in the oversight committee. Uh, you know, I, politics has always been a tough sport. And you know you're going to get opposition research. You know you're going to have books written on attacks. You just don't think that uh, campaigns are going to be uh, sending people out to Russia to try to dig up dirt on uh, their opponents. And that's really the story of these hearings. It's not that President Biden uh, did anything wrong. It's the lengths to which Trump went and people like William Barr went to try to destroy him for political reasons. You know, we see what's happening in the House Oversight Committee during the, you know, C-SPAN or Midas Touch network broadcasts of it. What I'm really interested, though, in is, look, I'm sure you are friends with some of your colleagues on, on the other side. What are they saying about their own dysfunction? Like, privately, are they saying to you that there are, like, real issues? How would you describe what's going on behind the scenes with them? Well, first of all, everyone will tell you that the person who's really running the place is Marjorie Taylor Greene. Let me give you a very concrete uh, example. Yesterday, we all had votes in the oversight hearing uh, for a, a bill, uh, about eight to 10 votes. And usually you show up on time. And if you don't show up on time, you miss those votes. I'm sitting there 10 minutes after the hearing's supposed to start, and they're holding open the votes, they're not starting the votes. And I said, why aren't they starting the votes? They always start on time, regardless of who misses it. Guess who wasn't there? Marjorie Taylor Greene. So she has the power to get committees, not to even start voting until uh, she uh, graces them with her presence. So she's running things in the Republican Congress. She's far more powerful than McCarthy was or Johnson is. Uh, and you know, people need to realize that uh, in, in terms of who's actually uh, calling the shots. And are your Republican colleagues, though, saying to you, like, like, look, we're stuck. We don't know what to do. I mean, we see Congress member Gallagher, Congress member Buck already leave. Congress member Buck teased a former Congress member Buck now teased more. We're going to leave. You know, are they saying to you, hey, Congressman kind of like there's like this is the worst it's ever been. Like these people are crazy. Is, is there anything like that going on? You know, people are careful. They used to snicker more at President Trump back in 2017 when I got first elected. Now, uh, I think people are really fearful for even in private uh, criticizing either president, either the president or his allies, uh, because they fear that if they do that one tweet, then they're going to have a primary challenge. But I will say that 
uh, there are a lot of people like Mike Gallagher who are frustrated on Ukraine aid, who are frustrated uh, that there is no uh, process, that they can't govern. Uh, but they're careful uh, to share that even in private, knowing uh, the consequences that if they uh, deviate from the uh, from from the group, uh, they're going to uh, face a terrible price. And that's very different than Democrats. We we criticize each other all the time. I mean, I'm criticizing the president one day on MSNBC on Gaza and then the next day campaigning for him. I think that's the beauty of the Democratic Party, actually. You know, you mentioned Marjorie Taylor Greene running the Republican Party right now. And one of the things that I just note, it's not even a political thing. It's just a very kind of mean spirited thing and bullying thing. I mean, you know, one of the main attacks that they have on Hunter Biden is over um, addiction. And they want to bring up these photos of him at his lowest point and You know, and he's someone who's gone through recovery. I mean, there are tens of millions of Americans. We all have a family member, maybe ourselves, who have been recovering, whether it's from alcoholism, drug addiction, prescription drug addiction. And these MAGA Republicans seem to just make a a mockery out of that in a way that I don't know how to describe it other than it's 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 just apolitically very cruel. You've seen that in person. I mean, what what's going on there? It's cruel, and I think it backfires. Uh, one of the uh, phone call records that they released was President Biden leaving a message for Hunter Biden, and he basically says, "I love you, son, and I care about you, and I want you to do anything to get your." back up on your feet and and no, I'm not gonna judge you and I'm there for you. And I thought the whole country should hear this voicemail. It's one of the most humanizing things for President Biden. I mean, the only thing that President Biden is guilty of is uh, loving his son and loving him deeply. A lot of other people in politics may have tried to create some distance or said, oh, you we don't want the negative stories, but this shows that Biden put his family and his son first. There's not an iota of evidence that he ever did anything improper when it came to uh, business involvement uh, or, or that President Biden ever used his influence. There is evidence that he cared about Hunter Biden. And so let the American people make that decision. Do you want your president to be a caring father uh, or do you want him to just be political and write off any family member who may create an embarrassing headline? I think people want a caring father as president. You know, before I started this pro-democracy media network, I was a lawyer and my uh, client and business partner was Colin Kaepernick, who was ridiculed by MAGA Republicans for peacefully taking a knee to bring attention to uh, issues concerning police brutality. And I remember at that time when I was a lawyer, the statements that you were making in support of the First Amendment and in support of Colin Kaepernick as well, who um, was a football player in your congressional district. You know, yeah, now the 49ers, we should have never let him go. Right. And now you have the MAGA Republicans led by Donald Trump at the beginning of all of their events and speeches. They've changed the national anthem. They've replaced the lyrics with the J6 anthem, which is a song sung by the most dangerous insurrectionists, some who attacked Officer Sicknick. 27 of the 29 in the D.C. jail assaulted police officers. So the Republicans led by Trump, this is at every event, they say, please rise and pledge yourself to the J6 hostages who have been unfairly treated. And then they play a manipulated version sung by the hostages of our anthem. I can't even get my, I can't even wrap my head around that. And the media ignores that. And for me being on the front lines of representing Colin Kaepernick and seeing what he went through and now seeing this, like it's beyond me. What do you make of all of that? Well, you're pointing out the extremism and the lack of normalcy of what Trump represents. I mean, you know, those images were horrific. I was of course in the, uh, in the complex, in the Cannon building and you had, uh, thousands of people come in and vandalize the Capitol, uh, in some cases hit uh, and attack police officers, uh, chant death to the Republican vice president, Mike Pence, chase senators and Congress people to uh, try to uh, accost them and in cases potentially assault them uh, without regard to party. It was one of the most shameful scenes 
uh, of American democracy that uh, in my lifetime, certainly the most shameful. And to, to, to think now that we've got a major nominee who is uh, glorifying uh, a day that uh, everyone should be embarrassed about, it just shows the stakes of this election. Uh, and if and we should not kid ourselves what will happen if Donald Trump assumes office. He's going to basically uh, politicize the Justice Department, dismissing cases of people who engaged in vandalism and and, uh, uh, and, and making it uh, using the Department of Justice uh, for political retribution. I mean, it's a, it will be a scary time in this country. You know, and the stakes of that authoritarianism, the wannabe authoritarianism. But let, let's talk, though, about the case for President Biden, the case for Democrats, the case for the pro-democracy movement. Well, Donald Trump and MAGA Republicans are trying to divide Americans and spread fear. Let's talk about what it would look like, like when, when, when American voters see this choice. Let's talk about the choice of President Biden, who, by the way, you, as you said, I can criticize him on this, I can agree with him on this, but I support him for these reasons. Let's just talk about as as people are thinking about where they're going to be. Um, we're seeing momentum even shifting right now. Describe the kind of the the, the pro democracy case for President Biden, Democrats, and, and what that would mean uh, in twenty twenty four. Well, I'll make three simple points for why we all need to be passionate behind President Biden. First is abortion rights. Uh, the equality of women is on the ballot. Uh, if President Biden isn't reelected, you're going to have statewide abortion bans of the kinds you see in Arizona, and, and you're gonna have state legislatures take away women's rights to control their own body and basically devalue women and girls in our society as less than equal. A second, you're gonna have the Project 2025, which we need to speak about more clearly. I mean. This time, Trump isn't coming in uh, without a plan, uh, without a transition plan. He's got people ready to appoint, and what are they gonna do? They're gonna mass fire people at the State Department, at the Justice Department, at the Pentagon, in agencies, and put in cronies uh, to run America. It's one of the most scary visions. President Biden, of course, believes in institutions, as would, by the way, uh, a Mitt Romney, who I disagree with, or uh, a, a number of Nikki Haley, who I totally disagreed with, but they would not go and do what Donald Trump is going to do, which is just mass start firing people who have expertise. And the third is the economic case. And we've got to make this very, very clearly. Donald Trump went around to communities that were hurting, uh, that had had a uh, a broken spirit, broken pride, and they had legitimate anger. Our jobs went offshore, the factories closed, the, uh, the, the towns were hollowed out as wealth piled up in places like Silicon Valley in my district. And so Trump said, I'm gonna bring you back. I'm gonna bring back these factories. Here's my question. Where were the factories that Donald Trump promised? Where were the aluminum factories, the steel factories, the textile factories? None. Why? Because he did a corporate tax cut for the wealthiest. Those who had stocks got richer. Those who had corporate executives got richer. Uh, people in my district got richer. What well, President Biden came in and said, yeah, I agree. OK, we've got a huge challenge in these communities and towns. And what I'm going to do is bring manufacturing back. More manufacturing jobs created than in the past 40 years. Towns having semiconductor factories, having battery factories, having new industry, uh, revitalizing places that were left out. And we've got a clear economic choice. Donald Trump, more tax cuts for corporations. Joe Biden, more manufacturing, more industry, more relief to actual working families. Congressman Khanna, thank you for joining us as always. Thank you. Hit subscribe. We're on our way to 3 million subscribers. Thanks to your support and have a great day. Real quick, Meta just changed their algorithm to suppress political content. Please follow our Instagram at Midas Touch right now as we head towards 400,000 followers so you don't miss a beat.